Welcome to the Anlinger Center for Energy Environment's Highlight Seminar Series, where we hear from notable experts from all over the world. I'm delighted to introduce today Adam Weirman, who is a professor in the Computing and Mathematical Sciences at Caltech, where he directs the Information Science and Technology Initiative. He received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University in 2007 and has been at Caltech since then. He's a recipient of the ACM Sigmetrics Rising Star Award, the IEEE Communication Society William Bennett Prize, and NSF Career Award, and multiple teaching awards. Uh, I've heard Adam give a number of talks over the years, and they are always fascinating in bringing tremendous clarity and rigor to important real-world problems. Just a moment of housekeeping before we get started, just to remind you that uh, on Zoom, everybody's muted, but if you have questions, you can enter them in using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And Adam is gonna be talking, stopping at various points in the talk to take questions, so feel free to go ahead and add questions as you go along through the talk so that we can uh, pull those together to ask Adam during those break times. And so, Adam, take it away. Great, thanks, thanks, Jen. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me just get my screen share going and we can get started. So, uh, Thanks. Uh, I, yeah, I, I always have enjoyed uh, my visits to Princeton. It's, it's fun. I'm looking forward to meeting with many of you uh, this afternoon. I, I hope uh, that you enjoy the talk. I like, like Jen said, please, please ask me some questions. I always find that the uh, virtual uh, interaction you know, through talks is a challenge for a speaker, and it, it's nice to get feedback and understand a little bit about uh, where people are in terms of understanding what I say and what you know questions and make it more like a conversation uh, if at all possible. Um, so just to just to get started here, uh, this is this is work from uh, a kind of a, a long set of papers, uh, not just one paper that I'll talk about today. And I'm I'm really going to try to introduce uh, the approach that our group here at Caltech uh, has been taking around some energy problems and focus on one particular kind of direction that has been ongoing in the group for quite a while, uh, which is online optimization and energy. Uh, but before we get to the online optimization part, let me give those the broader context of, of what we're doing in the group. So, you know, renewable energy at this point, it's, it's not an overstatement. It's not coming anymore. It's here. Uh, it really is you know, already today making up a huge percentage of our generation, uh, re, you know, usage in the US and still growing. Uh, although there was this leveling in, in recent years, but still growing very quickly uh, in general. And, you know, the growth uh, is driven and sort of validated in large part by the uh, standards that many states are adopting. So it's kind of amazing to think about it, but at this point, uh, 15, actually more than 15, uh, just a couple have added to this in recent uh, months, uh, 15 states have 100% clean energy targets. Now these are decades away, but still, this is a really ambitious goal that is becoming uh, very prominent uh, in the US. And, and I think the question that's driven a lot of you know, people in, in uh, the energy area and, and our group in particular is, to imagine how to get there, but also to imagine uh, not just how to get there in terms of the technologies we need in terms of better storage and uh, you know better generation technologies and things like this, uh, but to imagine just suppose we have those things, uh, suppose wind and solar and, and batteries and all these things do become cheap and widely available, still is 100% clean energy feasible, a feasible goal. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's pretty widely realized that even with those things, there are, there are some significant challenges uh, to integrating them in a way that we can actually run our energy system, run the grid uh, with 100% clean energy. And so that's kind of the, been the focus of our group is, you know, suppose the, you know, the, uh, chemists and material scientists, material engineering, and all these sorts of folks are successful in bringing us these uh, amazing technologies. Uh, what can we do with them? How do we integrate them? Uh, and when we think about the challenges, the you know probably the the most widely understood one and the one that you always start with is just intermittency and variability of uh, renewable sources like wind and solar. And so you know this is this is a pretty common plot to show. Uh, what it shows is one location. Uh, 
each little line corresponds to the trajectory of generation over a day. So the x-axis is 24 hours and each line is one day in a month. And then the black line shows the average over the month. Uh, and so you can see that, you know, even in the same location, there's huge intermittency, huge variability and huge unpredictability in, in the generation from these uh, sources that we're going to depend on uh, if we want to make the, you know, achieve sort of 100% clean energy usage. And so, you know, why is this a challenge? It's a challenge because the grid requires generation to equal demand at all times in all locations. Uh, and, you know, how do you do that when this is the source? Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the first one. And, and, you know, you can see the, the complexity that this creates because, you know, if you're planning on wind that doesn't arrive, you have to curtail the wind. And so that's a waste of this energy uh, and an inefficiency in the system. On the other hand, if uh, you uh, are planning on, yeah, are planning on, or if you're planning on the average, sorry, and the, and the wind uh, arrives in full, then you have to curtail. If you're planning on, you know, the uh, sunny day, and a cloud comes over, uh, then you need backup generation to be able to kick in very quickly uh, to replace that uh, usage. And you know that tends to be the dirtier form of conventional generation if you're going to need that quick response from your generator. Uh, and so you know those are two big challenges and inefficiencies that come from intermittency. Uh, but maybe the the point here that gets a little bit buried sometimes. It's still a very prominent point, but especially for people who maybe aren't as close to this. Uh, another huge challenge that comes from wind and solar is that it changes the net demand profile that we experience. And so this is a very famous uh, plot in California, which shows the net load, which is the energy demand of consumers, uh, minus the renewable energy available, minus the wind and solar. And so the net load is, is the, you know, that difference. Uh, and you can see that, you know, what this is tend to, tends to call is it's, it's tend to be referred to as changing a camel to a duck. And so, you know, in 2012, the blue line, uh, this kind of looked like a camel. Uh, and today, this is looking like a duck. So today's curve is called a duck curve. And, you know, when you, when you look at this, this, this has significant impact on operation of the grid and efficiency of the grid. Uh, because what you're tending to do when you're running the grid, there's some generators, some conventional generators, nuclear is an example, where you can't adjust them very quickly. Uh, and if you can't adjust them quickly, you have their you know, baseload generators, and you have to kind of let them be steady uh, here. You can't kind of ramp them up and ramp them down quickly. And so if you have this drop from, you know, 2013 to 2020 in the minimal demand you require, the minimal net demand, that means that you can make much less use of baseload uh, to fulfill this. And that means that you're using peaker generators, which tend to be dirtier uh, more often at a high, and at a higher rate. So just that change leads to, you know, dirtier, less efficient uh, generation portfolio for the grid. Uh, you also have steeper ramping uh, as a result of the duck curve kind of coming out. And steeper ramping, again, leads to the need for more peaker generators, and which tend to be dirtier. You have a higher peak than you did before. And so higher peak means more conventional generation uh, is needed, not less, because uh, you still need to have it online if you have this peak, even if you're not using it all the time. Uh, and so, you know, the best case uh, scenario in terms of reacting to these changes in the, in the net demand curve is that they increase the demand uh, or the need for dirty generation, dirty conventional generation, uh, and that they lead to curtailment of renewables. So even if you have a lot of renewables, uh, you'll end up curtailing them because of uh, these factors and the changes in the demand curve. And that's the best case. The work, uh, and and you see this happening already. So this is a, a forecast, but it's it's actually been a very accurate one, where you see economic curtailment and both security constrained curtailment. So things about balancing the grid and economic curtailment, things about minimizing cost of renewable generation as a result of the change in the net demand curve. And so this is the x-axis here is the penetration of uh, solar capacity. Uh, and so, you know, this is this is a big problem. But of course, the worst case is that this leads to blackouts because you can't react quickly enough uh, for these changes, and you know the peaks uh, are more higher and harder to predict. The base load is less able to help because the of you know the duck curve that I showed you. And then what happens is blackouts, 
Uh, and, you know, in California, we've seen a lot more blackouts, both rolling blackouts and, and un unexpected blackouts uh, as uh, solar power and other thick factors of the grid change and nuclear uh, becomes less used and things like this. And so, so this is a real effect that is being experienced today in places where uh, renewables are more prominent. And so what do we need? It, you know, getting to 100% is still the goal and it's, it's not an impossible goal, but it, it means that there's really significant research challenges beyond just the development of wind and solar and storage that need to be addressed to get there. Uh, and I like to think of this as, you know, three basic categories, markets, uh, new approaches for reliability, because we're going to be faced with challenges to reliability as we integrate these uh, renewable sources, and integration of adaptive distributed energy resources uh, to help provide flexibility. Uh, and so we've been working quite a bit on all three of these directions. This talk, I'll focus on the third, but before we get there, I wanted to say a little bit about the first two. Uh, and so in terms of markets, just you know, as a caricature of, you know, what the issue is here. Um, the issue is that now you have new forms of generation coming in, these intermittent generation, uh, you know, like wind and solar, and these can't be treated the same way you treat nuclear, gas, coal in the markets. You can't plan for them days, months in ahead. You can't, uh, you know, treat them the same way in terms of reliability uh, as you would, you know, these other generators that you can, you know, plan and schedule and count on turning on when you need them. Uh, you know, a, a solar plant can only deliver if there's sun. Uh, and so you can't, you know, uh, plan that that will happen uh, in advance. And, you know, have, you need backup plants, you need backup generation, you need uh, more sort of ancillary services to provide that response. And, you know, so intermittencies are a big challenge, but also they magnify the effect of non-convexities in these markets. So there have always been non-convexities in power systems markets, but you, you end up being able to handle them with band-aids often in the current infrastructure, and those band-aids just aren't good enough when you add more non-convexities that come uh, from these renewable sources. And so you're seeing a lot of uh, opportunities for market manipulation uh, and market power exploitation that come as uh, aggregators controlling wind and solar farms integrate into these markets more. And so we've been working a lot on this, both on sort of exploring uh, what opportunities for manipulation there are uh, as wind and solar and aggregators come into the marketplaces, how you identify the opportunities and recognize when people are exporting them. And then of course, how you design markets where the, that minimize the impact of such opportunities for exploits. Uh, and, you know, just as a, a sort of illustration of this, one of our, our recent papers looked specifically at aggregators like Solar City, who own, you know, the solar rooftop arrays on many different uh, houses, hundreds of thousands of houses uh, in a city like Los Angeles, and what opportunities they could have to manipulate prices by curtailing, reducing the amount of generation they uh, put into the grid uh, in a strategic way to create congestion in the grid. And you can really see that they have the opportunity to, through curtailments of you know, less than 0.5% over their whole fleet, impact prices by 20, 30, 40%. Uh, in real situations. And so there's a, an enormous opportunity for them to you know, do this and an economic incentive for them to do this. And the impact of that, of course, is uh, prices for consumers being much higher than they need to be uh, because of the integration of uh, aggregators like this. And so I think there's a huge challenge that we're gonna be, that's coming to a head in these markets. And, and to deal with them, we need to price non-convexities and price intermittency appropriate. And so uh, that's what we've been working on in that direction. Um, reliability is another one where I think, you know, things are really coming to a head. We've seen, you know, a really big increase in the amount of uh, cascading failures and rolling blackouts in a lot of places in the U.S. and beyond. Uh, and I think, you know, the issue here is that traditionally, when you approach reliability in power systems, you approach it with uh, N minus uh, one planning, you know, so you plan that if a line, if one line fails, you can still uh, keep the grid up and running. Uh, and that's a great approach if you have an idea of which lines are going to fail and you can plan specifically for that. It requires a lot of planning and a lot of simulation. But understanding the evolution of cascades is, is really hard. And so this, this N minus one planning 
takes, you know, is a huge computational effort. And actually, it's probably not that effective when you think of the types of uh, sort of issues that solar and the intermittency that solar and wind will play, because that's not going to be an n minus one reliability issue. That's going to be a correlated uh, sort of issue across many aspects of the grid if the wind isn't blowing the way you expect or the sun isn't shining the way you expect. And so you need other approaches for identifying and containing uh, the, you know, the cascades that might come from those unexpected events. And, you know, the limitation here has been understanding cascades in power systems is extremely difficult mathematically because they don't happen the way that you think of, you say, an epidemic spreading over a network. It's not that one edge fails and then a neighboring edge fails. They're very discontinuous. One edge failing in one part of the network could mean the next edge that fails is 20 miles away in a different part of the network, and then the next one is 20 miles in a different direction, and so on. And, and you can't just assume that a failure will propagate locally. Uh, through a power system because of the sort of non-convex impacts of Kirchhoff's laws. Uh, and so we've been using, in the last few years, we've developed a new theory for how to study these cascades based on, based on some spectral uh, representations of power flows and networks. Uh, and the theory actually suggests something very counterintuitive, which is, you know, the way to get reliability in the power system is not to kind of add edges in order to have reliability in case one fails, but actually to remove edges so that you can localize failures when they happen. Uh, and so if you understand how failures might propagate, you can actually remove, and that's what this figure is trying to show. It, it's trying to show that if you remove these edges between clusters so that you have kind of very limited connectivity across clusters, uh, then actually you get a situation which is represented by this heat map on the right where if a failure happens in one of these clusters, you can provably guarantee that it won't propagate beyond those clusters. And so you can get localization of failures and therefore avoid the big cascading failures that we've seen often as a result of these unexpected events. And so this is kind of a little bit of a out of the box new approach that of course should be integrated with other uh, approaches to uh, you know, managing uh, reliability, but I, I think it's something very different that is very kind of rigorously uh, based on a new spectral representation of power systems. And I won't talk about to, that today, but it's if, for those who are interested, I, I'd be very happy to talk about it in meetings afterwards. Um, so today though, my focus is gonna be on this, this last piece, which is uh, the integration of adaptive resources uh, into the grid. And, and what I mean here is things like electric vehicles, uh, home storage, uh, you know, smart air conditioning systems, smart pool pumps, uh, and even kind of large scale things like data centers, where they're kind of the demands, the energy demands of them are flexible in some way. Uh, you don't care where your air condition, when your air conditioning is running, you just care that it maintains a good temperature for you. You don't care when your pool pump is running, you just, mean, you just want it to make sure that your pool is the right temperature and clean. Uh, when you want to use it. Same thing with EV charging. You like how you have flexibility on when the charging happens. You just want a charged car when you need to use your car. Uh, and so the flexibility that these sorts of smart resources have uh, is something that hopefully uh, can be a very valuable tool for the grid in terms of managing these challenges that come with uh, intermittent renewable energy sources. And so DERs like that have enormous potential. Uh, and kind of if we come back to this duck curve, uh, you can really sort of visualize the potential they have. You know, in the short time scale, they help you manage variability uh, so that, you know, the intermittency that comes with, you know, small fluctuations can be help, dealt with by calling on the flexibility of those resources. Uh, when you're kind of thinking about this dipping valley, uh, that seems to be getting deeper and deeper each year because of the you know, sun shining a lot in the middle of the day. Uh, it can help you avoid an oversupply there so you can use more base load uh, without uh, worry because you can uh, kind of uh, call on, you know, charge your electric vehicle, vehicles during that point, call on loads to, to use generation, to use electricity then and therefore avoid the, the oversupply that, ha that happens in that situation where you have too much because the sun is shining uh, at, full at full bore there. Uh, it also helps you reduce ramping by deferring when you use uh, generation and also shortfall because again, you can defer the, when you're using the, the electricity when you're using the generation there. Uh, and so it kind of affect, you know, it's a valuable tool for all of the challenges uh, that are coming from renewable generation. But 
you know, as you kind of uh, realize, I'm sure that realizing that potential is very difficult uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, some of those reasons just have to do with markets, building markets that, uh, you know, encourage uh, the usage of TER capacity when you need it uh, is, is a challenge in its own right. And that is something we've been working on, but, but I'll focus more on the control challenge here, which is, you know, very easy to kind of say in one sentence, uh, you want to use them to balance supply and demand, but predicting future generation is hard and, you know, changing an action is often costly for these. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you adjust the temperature too frequently on your air conditioning, uh, you'll re significantly reduce the lifetime of your air conditioning, air conditioning unit. And, you know, as a early entry into these programs in California, I'm, you know, I can report that this is a real effect. Uh, our air conditioner was fried by some of the early uh, programs that Southern California Edison was running uh, in our area to sort of turn on and off and react to grid fluctuations. Um, the same thing happens with EVs. Uh, so we run a test bed uh, for electric vehicles that's actually open if there's any uh, if there's any people working on electric vehicle algorithms charging markets here uh, we have a open access test bed where you can actually deploy uh, different algorithms in a real-time way on the test bed to test with real cars in, in garages at Caltech and JPL uh, and so if you're interested in that let me know um, Stephen Lowe is running that project uh, and the data from that is also very uh, available publicly so if you're interested just send me an email um, but here again, if you're changing the uh, charging rate of uh, a battery in an EV very frequently, uh, it can significantly impact the lifetime of the battery, which is, of course, a very big expense for, for owners and not something they're willing to put up with. Uh, and then, you know, one of the areas that I worked on a lot early on in this uh, was with data centers and with data centers, frequent power changing modes, uh, frequent changes to power saving modes. I really have a major uh, lead to a major reduction in the lifetime of the servers. Uh, and so you kind of, as a rule of thumb, want to make sure you're leaving the server in its current state for at least a couple hours. Otherwise, the wear and tear cost will out, wear, outdo any savings in costs that you do from switching the power saving mode either on or off. And so the, the challenge along all of these is really uh, you want to adapt the usage of these distributed energy resources. Uh, but in doing so, you need to be cognizant of the impact in terms of wear and tear costs. Uh, and so you need to kind of know you're going to be able to uh, leave it in the state that you're switching to for a long time, or at least not change the state very often uh, to make it worth it. But how do you do that when you don't know the future? Uh, and you know, this is a really core algorithmic question. And, and so something that we've worked on a lot at Caltech over the last decade, actually, at this point. Uh, and so the way that we, we tend to formulate this uh, actually, this is a good point to stop for uh, some questions if you uh, if you'd like. So this is kind of the the end of my motivation, and and what I'll do at this point is I'll switch gears and I'll talk about an algorithmic problem that captures this sort of uh, control challenge that we face with DERs. Great, um, thanks. Actually, there are a few questions. One sort of a clarification question, maybe you're about to get into, is what do you mean by the non convexities of renewables? Yes. That's great. So so non convexities here. Think about the the cost, you know, so non-convexities have this zero marginal cost uh, that, uh, so there's a kind of initial base cost that, you know, you have to do put in, there's some maintenance cost, but there's there's often a sort of near zero margin, marginal cost for these. And, and that creates a lot of challenges uh, for markets. Uh, you know, uh, the, other, the other thing to think of is any generator, even a traditional one that has some sort of a startup cost, uh, so, you know, the going from zero generation to positive generation has some cost involved to it, involved with it. That's going to lead to a non-convexity because you tend to have decreasing marginal costs uh, once the generator is on. And so uh, the convexity of the cost curve is one place that this comes in. The convexity of the, uh, the network constraints uh, involved with it as well. Um, Kirchhoff's laws, for example, is another one. And, you know, the, the big challenge is all of, you know, basically all of market economics is built on convexity assumptions. There, there are, of course, some study of non-convex markets, but all of the theory that uh, electricity markets are based on is really relying on the convexity assumption. And, and it's been a huge challenge that a lot of uh, ISOs, a lot of the market design, uh, you know, operations are dealing with is how, how do you price non-convexities in these marketplaces? 
Great. And there are a bunch of questions related to the state of the art and the state of the industry, you know, state of the art for battery and storage systems for being able to avoid resorting to sort of dirty energy initially. Yeah proving network reliability, the market power of aggregators, and so on. You may want to leave some of these to the end because I imagine they're fairly uh, rich topics in their own right, but do you want to say a little bit now about the... Yeah, that's true. I'll leave, I'll leave most of that to the end, but I'll say you know, that in some sense, there's been a huge amount of progress in all of these fronts over the last uh, you know, years, and you know, storage is getting better and more efficient and more cost-effective. Same thing with solar and wind and other other sort of renewable resources that are being developed. And so, uh, you know, we're making progress, but but there's just a fundamental challenge that's created, you know, for conventional generation in these things. And and my perspective is that you're not going to get away from these challenges. Uh, you know, you might mitigate them a little bit through the, you know, the actual technologies, uh, but they're going to have to be dealt with head on with the control policies and with the algorithms, no matter how good the, the technologies that you're integrating get. Um, Great. I think we should probably let you go on. There are a few more questions. Why don't we save some of those for the end? Perfect. Sounds good. Okay, so so now we're going to switch gears and get into the actual kind of algorithmic work here. Uh, and I'm going to present it in the context of uh, what's a very classical uh, model in kind of online learning uh, 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 operations research and and uh, yeah online learning operations research and, and online algorithms, which is smoothed online convex optimization. And so, what do I mean by that? So, think of you know an action space and think of this as say the configuration of your DER. So, this is the charging rates that you're going to use for all the cars in your garage, for example. Uh, or the you know state of your servers in a data center, for example, uh, and you know you have some current operational action that you're implemented, uh, and in a given time step, there's going to be some cost function uh, that you deal with, and this cost function is kind of the uh, the impact you feel because of renewable uh, uh, availability at that time step, market prices for energy at that time step, efficiency of your system at that time step, workloads that you're going to deal with at that time step, whatever that is, that's all aggregated into some uh, cost function. And then you're going to choose your new system state based on that cost function. And then the cost, you know, the, your experience there is modeled by a hitting cost, your cost on that function, the cost of your action on that function, uh, and the switching cost, the amount of change you did to your system to move from your action at the previous time step to your action at the current time step. And you can think of both of these as being very general. For the, for the talk, I'm focusing on, focusing on convex, but we have uh, emerging work uh, that allows for this to be non-convex. Uh, and for the switching cost, you can think of it as a norm, uh, or you can think of it as just a general function that depends on you know, your current action and your previous action. Uh, and so, you know, this is going to happen repeatedly. So you get another cost function, you choose another action, uh, you experience the hitting cost and the switching cost on that action, uh, and so on. And so, you know, here, what you see is, you know, you, you kind of often want to move to nearby the minimizer of the cost that you're seeing, but you hedge a little bit. So maybe you don't move all the way to the minimizer, uh, because you don't want to have, you don't want to have too much movement. Um, that, that's, that's the issue. And, and, you know, right now I'm showing it as if you observe the cost function before you choose your action. Of course, in reality, it will be using a prediction of that cost function uh, to make your decision. Uh, but I want to kind of isolate the hardness coming from the switching cost here. So I don't want you to focus on how hard it is to predict the costs. Uh, for now, I want you to focus on the sort of core algorithmic issue, which is without knowing the future, it's really hard to know whether to move or not. So, you know, how do you decide how much to switch, whether to be greedy and go all the way to the minimizer or whether to hedge your bets and not move very much without knowing the future. And to kind of make that sort of really obvious, the, the example of the three cost function that I chose here, uh, you know, the, the blue dots always move to kind of nearby the minimizer, but the green dot would have been much better because it's you know, very close to the minimizer of the first function, far from the minimizer of the second, but the second is a pretty shallow function, so you don't lose much by staying there. And then it's kind of very near the minimizer of the third as well. So you could have avoided a lot of movement cost by just moving from X zero to the green dot and sticking at the green dot from then on and not making any more movements. But without knowing what the future cost functions look like, you don't know whether that's a good idea because you know, it could have been that not moving to X2 would have been a disaster because the next cost function had a minimizer way out here. 
uh, and and you know that kind of uncertainty about what the future looks like is what makes it hard to do well in an online problem like this where the cost functions are coming without some predictive model of the future and so summarizing this what what you have is uh, a model where you're making decisions uh, uh, in an online way as the cost functions arrive and you have a decision from a convex action space uh, that's trying to optimize a convex hitting cost subject to some switching cost. Uh, and the way that you know, I'll be focusing on evaluating this in this talk is in terms of what's called the competitive ratio, which is uh, a very hard metric to do well on. Uh, it's an adversarial metric. So it says, I have no uh, model about how the cost functions are going to come. I'm going to assume that some adversary who's trying to make things as bad as possible for me is choosing those cost functions and they're completely unconstrained in how they're choosing them. And yet I'm going to compare myself to an optimal uh, as if I knew those cost functions, an optimal where the, you know, the optimal is just solving this uh, optimization problem, knowing the cost functions, knowing all the CT in advance, and then choosing the actions. Uh, and so this is a very hard to achieve uh, a, a baseline. And so we'll look at the ratio between those and that's called the competitive ratio. Another metric that is very common to look at for problems like this is called the regret, where the regret is kind of the additive difference, uh, but the, the key difference is what the bar for comparison is. So uh, most traditionally regret uses a static decision as the uh, compare bar for comparison. So a little less aggressive in its bar for comparison. It says again that you know all the cost functions offline, but you're choose just using a fixed uh, sort of uh, action uh, to evaluate, you know, so the best fixed action is hindsight as opposed to the best dynamic action in hindsight. There is also a lot of work that looks at dynamic regret, which does look at kind of offline optimal as the comparison point rather than static optimal. And at that point, uh, the results are very parallel. It's just a multiplicative factor versus an additive factor. Um, Okay, so, so that's what we're going to look at. And, you know, just to tie this back to the high level story at the beginning, we got interested in this because of sustainable data centers. And actually, you know, a lot of uh, four or five years ago at this point, I think, I came and I gave a whole talk on sustainable data centers uh, in this seminar series. Uh, and so some of you have heard me talk about this, but it's kind of the microcosm of, of the motivation that I gave at the beginning here, where, you know, instead of looking at running the grid on renewables, can you run a data center on renewable energy? And uh, you know, this is you know, a, again, a very challenging problem, something that is almost absurd on the face of it, because you know, of course you can't run a data center just on solar because there's no energy available at night and you are gonna have to do some work at night. Uh, so how close to that can you get? Uh, and to achieve that, you have this balance between uh, adapting your capacity, your server capacity, so dynamic right-sizing of the power savings modes of the, the servers, uh, and deferring the workloads that have flexibility in when you can do them. So the archival work, the, the things that are not real-time requests, doing them at times when there is renewable energy available or when you've been able, when you have storage, stored energy available. Uh, and so this was something that we worked on for, for a number of years and, and this challenge is the same and, and the SOCO algorithms uh, are really effective in this context. It's really a, a sort of natural place to make a match to, to implementation. And you know, so we did actually get a chance to implement this with HP and they have a product uh, and now there's uh, similar uh, sort of products and deployed applications at Microsoft and Google and a number of other places as well. Uh, and so I think, you know, there was a lot of progress there and, and you know, you, you never quite get to the 100%, but you can really do quite well in data centers where there's a lot of uh, deferrable kind of deadline flexible uh, jobs in, in the background. And, and most places there, there is that because there's a lot of the archival work the, that has to happen and that uses up a lot of capacity. And so, so that was data centers, and that was a while ago now. I said I talked about it five years or so ago. And you know, since then, the same model of online optimization has become used all over the place in energy. So whether it be demand response, optimal power flow, economic dispatch, uh, one that we've done a lot of work on is EV charging. I already mentioned that we have this test bed at Caltech. Uh, and Stephen Lowe has a startup that uh, actually was recently acquired on this front. And, and the basis of the algorithms for doing dynamic charging is uh, the sort of online optimization framework here. The switching costs are really important to making sure that you're not damaging the, the batteries that are in people's cars here. Uh, and, you know, I, I'd say, you know, these, one thing to emphasize is a lot of these applications have 
extra complexity compared to the model that I showed you. You know, if you're talking about EV charging, there's a storage uh, aspect that's really important to model, uh, which wasn't in the formulation I described. And in the optimal power flow problem, there's a ramp constraint. Uh, where you just can't change the generation that's coming out of con conventional generators uh, more than a, at, at quicker than a certain rate. And so you have to impose that really as a constraint in the problem. And those things do add extra algorithmic complexity. And you know, so there's lots of other places this is done as well. And I'll come back to the algorithmic complexity that is needed for those. Um, okay, so, so that's energy, but I, I want to make the point, even though this is an energy seminar, that the model is really useful well beyond energy as well. Uh, and so just to give a plug for some other work that's going on at Caltech, uh, Yu Sung Yu has some really exciting work uh, that makes use of this kind of framework as well in facial animation and robotic planning. Uh, and so in facial animation, the way to make the mapping, since it's not quite obvious, is you know think of the hitting cost, that per round cost, as uh, you're trying to, you know what sound, you're, you're animating the mouth movement here, uh, and you know what's, what the mouth should look like to make a particular sound. Uh, and so once you identify the phonemes, you know kind of the, the fixed points that you should be aiming for to match the phonemes. And then you have to animate between them, and you have to animate between them smoothly, otherwise the animation will look terrible. And so you have kind of the hitting cost saying that you're keeping close to the ideal mouth shape, but that you're moving between them smoothly because of the switching costs. And similarly for robotic planning, uh, actually I should say, and that's deployed in, in, at Disney now, uh, and the robotic planning problem is deployed actually through Disney at ESPN, uh, where now the goal is you know, to have a ca robotic camera tracking, say, an NBA game. And the goal is you want to keep the ball in the center of the screen, uh, and that's your hitting cost. So how close is the ball to the center of the screen? But you can't have it jerkily moving around because if it's jerkily moving around, following the ball every time it bounces, uh, the quality of the video is terrible. And so you need a smoothing cost to make sure that uh, you're getting that smooth panning that you expect when you're watching a, a, a sports broadcast. Uh, and so that's too concrete. We've also been doing some work on portfolio management and uh, drone trajectory planning. Uh, and one that I'm really excited about going forward is video streaming. So here, again, the smoothing cost is uh, related to making sure that the rate uh, that you're, you know, the compression rate for the videos is not changing dramatically too often. You need to keep that fairly smooth, otherwise the quality of the user experience is terrible. Uh, but of course you want high quality for the stream without much interruption, and so that's the hitting cost in a given round is the quality uh, of the stream display given the congestion and all of those things. Uh, and there actually, uh, you know, I, some of the SOCO-based algorithms have now made it into the uh, standards at this point. And so there's been really a wide deployment of uh, things related to SOCO in energy, uh, but also outside of energy. And, and because of all those applications, you know, there's a huge amount of variations of this model. So I'm, I'm talking about the simplest one in this talk, but you can think of lots of different switching costs, whether they be norms or Bregman divergence or, or more general functions. In energy, often the storage constraints or ramping constraints are really important for the action set. Uh, and then depending on the problem, lots of different assumptions about the cost functions themselves tend to crop up. Um, okay, so uh, with that, hopefully the model and the motivation of the model are clear and it's a good time for me to take another round of questions before uh, the, uh, I talk about the algorithms. Yeah, there are a few questions about uh, de de defining hitting costs. That's something you, you mentioned early in the talk, just to make sure that people understand what that means. Perfect. Yeah, so the hitting cost is that cost per round. So in a given round, uh, the cost that you'll experience because of your action. If you think of, say, you know, if I come back to these applications, if I think of, you know, not an energy example, but the drone example, uh, you might have a trajectory that you want your drone to follow. The hitting cost is how close you are to that trajectory. Uh, and then the switching cost is how smoothly it's moving so that the drone isn't moving jerkily up and down too often, for example. Right, and another question, sort of a high level one, back to the question of storage and battery solutions, is that, you know, it, is the price difference starts to grow, you could imagine that there would be technologies that have larger capacity for, for storage. And yeah. It's a question of will the market pricing eventually lead to better solutions in that space? Yeah, I think it will. I think, you know, energy storage is the, 
should be the solution and we should have huge amounts of it deployed. I, I think that costs are going to come down quite quickly in the next few years and then we're going to have more and more deployment, especially in California, the, the, move, the market movement is, is in that direction. But that doesn't solve this problem because you still have to have the storage coordinated and integrated into the market in, in a way that it provides the service that you want. Uh, you know, one, one version of a future is storage gets integrated by an aggregator like SolarCity whenever they deploy a solar array. And that sounds great on the face of it. I think that's a, that's a beautiful solution to kind of have this local distributed storage network that you're using, but that creates huge challenges in terms of market design uh, that magnifies the opportunity for market power dramatically uh, through kind of curtailment. And then managing that integration into the system is exactly where you need uh, this kind of algorithmic uh, control because, you know, again, storage, uh, if you're drawing, withdrawing, drawing, withdrawing, and you're not kind of doing that in a smart way, the switching costs associated with it are going to have severe economic uh, impacts. Uh, and so you need to kind of manage it in a smart, coordinated, distributed way uh, via a mixture of market and, and control solutions. Awesome. And then one final question I should probably let you go on was just that if you've been collaborating with companies or governments on the algorithms that you're proposing here, if you could comment a little on that. Yeah, definitely. So, and the, let's see if I come back to some of these. So we, we have a, a number of partners locally. Uh, so as I mentioned, the EV charging uh, was a startup that's now been uh, acquired. And so there's, I, I forget the latest numbers, but, you know, 50 or 100 uh, different garages in California that are being managed there. Uh, with local utilities, we have a, a number of partnerships where we've actually been deploying and, uh, you know, actually test markets, test uh, demand response uh, control mechanisms and, and these sorts of things. Uh, and yeah, so and then on the IT side with data centers, we have we've been had a lot of partnerships with a number of companies into playing these smart management of the workloads. Uh, so we've been doing quite a number, quite a bit of that, actually, I, I won't talk about that too much here. But if you catch me afterwards, I can I can talk uh, a lot more about the applications. Uh, this talk, I'll focus more on the algorithmic side. Great. Great. Perfect. Okay, so jumping into the algorithm then. So my, my goal hopefully is you kind of understand the problem, why I care about it. Uh, and now I want to kind of give you, you know, a little bit of a, a course on why it's hard, why sort of the typical, uh, you know, uh, approaches you might imagine using don't quite get there. And then we have some exciting new algorithmic work that uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about at the end. So, so as a warm up to kind of get, get across why this is so challenging to think about, uh, you actually only need a very simple example to do this. So imagine a situation where you just have two cost functions, one that's linearly decreasing, one that's linearly increasing, and the adversary is just going to decide which of these to give you in any given round. Uh, and so that seems like a very simple situation to know what to do. And, you know, whenever you approach problems like this in the online world, the first thing that you always should try is to see whether greedy is good enough. Greedy, you know, myopic is what I mean, where what I, what I mean by that in this context is, you know, whenever the adversary gives you this cost function, you choose the minute cost minimizer, you know, one, whenever they give you the second cost function, you choose the cost minimizer, zero. Uh, and so this, you know, seems like a very natural thing. You're always doing good in a given round. Um, but it, it actually, the adversary can really uh, make you pay a huge penalty compared to the optimal in this situation, because if they give you two cost functions, one in which is steep and one of which is shallow, uh, and just alternate them, uh, the greedy algorithm will just switch back and forth from zero to one, zero to one, zero to one, which means it always pays hitting cost zero, uh, but it always has a switching cost of one. Uh, and so the, you know, the cost then is going to be order T, whereas an optimal offline algorithm would just always choose action one. Uh, and whenever the algorithm gives it C2, it pays one over T. Whenever it gives it C1, it pays zero. And so no matter what sequence the optimal gives it, it's going to have a cost of less than one. And so you have this uh, linear, you know, order T linear difference in the time horizon between the optimal and the greedy, which is about the worst possible you can have. Uh, and so you know, greedy just can really get messed up. And, and it kind of highlights the, the fact that because of the switching costs really are the big thing here, you have to pay attention to whether it's worth it to switch. You can't just switch in a myopic way. 
Um, now, a little bit more sophisticated, you know, maybe the, the thing that you'd really try first here as a researcher is to think about grading descent. And grading descent really is, you know, is known to work well in a lot of online optimization problems. And so it's a very natural choice. And what that would mean here is, you know, just taking little steps downhill uh, when you're given each, each of these. So there's lots of variations of grading descent. Whatever they would do, they all just take that little step down. And so, uh, you know, here what you have is, you know, if, you're, if the adversary gives you C2, you kind of march down the curve. At some point, you cross over, uh, and then the adversary starts giving you a different cost function, and you cross back. And so you, what you pay is you pay this upper envelope of the two cost functions if you're grading descent and you're facing an adversary. Uh, and that's not bad. It means that you learn this kind of intersection point between the cost functions, which from a regret standpoint is learning the static optimal solution. So if you were trying to optimize a static choice uh, in retrospect compared to an adversary giving you cost functions, that's the point you should learn. That's the point you should play. Uh, and so that's good. But the static point can be uh, an order of magnitude worse than the dynamic offline optimal in this context. So again, you can pay an order T uh, difference in cost between the static optimal and the dynamic optimal. So if you really care about optimal dynamic control, it's not good enough to learn the static optimal in this context. Uh, and you know, we can formalize this further. You know, I guess this, this highlights that it's crucial to make big jumps uh, and it's, it's something that's not limited to gradient descent. So basically, what we can prove is that any algorithm that is good for regret, which has a sublinear bound for regret, is going to be bad for competitive ratio because for an arbitrary constant, you know, if this is sublinear, this is going to zero, this has to be infinite. If this is a constant, then this has to be infinite for this bound to hold. So basically the theorem here, which is, you know, we proved a while ago now, is that you can't do well for an online algorithm uh, for both competitive ratio and regret, you either have to kind of do well in terms of learning a static policy or do well in terms of learning a competitive policy. Uh, but these are different goals. And, and in, in this context where we care about energy and using DERs, what we care about is learning the best dynamic policy. So we care about competitive ratio. And so that gets to the research now, which is, you know, it's, it's not so hard to be good for no regret. Gradient based algorithms will do it, but being competitive is hard and, and it's taken a long time to make progress on you know, finding algorithms uh, that can be constant and competitive. And so you know, the first order answer, and this is kind of, you know, I think one of the results I talked about the last time uh, I came to print, or not the last time, but the, the time I came and gave this seminar five years ago at Princeton, uh, was you know, to be able to do well in a one dimensional case. So uh, yes, we can do well. Uh, we can give an algorithm that's three competitive, but it only works when you have uh, problems that are one dimensional case. And you know, this was a starting point. This was after a lot of work, by a lot of people on this problem where you, you know, could do well for regret, but you just couldn't get there in terms of competitive ratio. So this was a, you know, a meaningful result at the time. Um, but, you know, and it led to a lot of follow-up work where was three the best? Well, no, you could do better than three. You could get two, but two is the best possible. But, you know, if you care about simple algorithms that don't use really long memory, well, now you can't get to two, three is the best, but you can't achieve it. So there was a long stream of work over, over multiple years kind of uh, pushing that uh, kind of result and that framework, uh, you know, quite a ways. Um, uh, but all of that work was in one dimension. Uh, and, you know, the reason was because, you know, one dimension, you know, going beyond that really was hard. And I remember, you know, I think for multiple years, I gave versions of talks on this problem where I said, you know, uh, uh, the big open problem here is what can we do outside of one dimension? Uh, and basically, you know, there was, there was progress, but only in the context of stochastic models or making assumptions about being able to observe the future or predict the future in some way. Uh, there was no progress on the general problem of trying to do well outside of one dimension for a long time. And just last year, uh, basically, we kind of formalized the reason why, which is that it's impossible. Uh, and so we have this result. There's another result uh, of a similar flavor by Sebastian Brubeck and a, a similar time horizon um, that you know, basically showed that there is an example of an online optimization problem called convex body chasing, where you can't do 
better than, uh, you can't do a constant competitive algorithm. You can only have a competitive ratio that depends on the dimension so that if you're solving it in D dimensions, your competitive ratio has to be at least D. Uh, and since the problems that we care about in all of these energy applications and all the other ones that I described are very high dimensional problems, this is a pretty uh, kind of negative result uh, uh, for, for the area. Uh, and it's you know even more negative in the sense that what this says is, even if you can predict, so even if you can perfectly forecast the next W cost functions, the next W uh, things that will arrive, which are bodies in the convex body chasing problem, uh, you still can't do better than root D competitive. Uh, and so just because I think it's, it's really interesting to see how simple this problem is uh, that illustrates this, this negative result, uh, I'll walk you through what it is. So it's, it's a special case of SOCO, where just like before, you now start with uh, a choice and an action. Uh, this is a two-dimensional body chasing problem I'm showing you. So you start with a given point and then you're going to chase bodies, which means at any given round a body shows up, you have to move to inside the body. Then a new body show, uh, you pay the cost for your movement. Again, a new body shows up, you have to move to into the new body, you pay the cost for your movement, and you know that continues over and over again. And so you can see this is very much like online convex optimization, except there's not a cost function that you're optimizing. There's just a place where you have to be in, and it doesn't matter where you are in it. The cost is the same as long as you're in it, but you have to be inside it. And so the issue is the same without knowing the future. You can't be optimal. So you know, here in this example, if we had known the future, we could have just moved in one step to this overlapping point and never paid any other movement cost because we didn't know that we moved around in this circle paying a lot of extra movement cost. So the challenge is the same. How do you know when to move? How do you know where to move and how far to move given that you don't know the future? Uh, and so, you know, this is the problem and, it, and it's easy to see that, you know, a SOCO algorithm could solve this because you could just for any given body have a cost function that was steep, out, infinite outside the body and, and zero inside the body. It's less hard to see the other direction, but it turns out the other direction is too. If you can solve a convex body chasing problem, you can solve an instance of SOCO too. Uh, so, you know, and the way you do that is you take any SOCO instance and you convert it into a body chasing problem. And it's not clear how to do it, but Sebastian Bubeck had the, a really nice idea of how to do it and formalized it where uh, you know, the natural thing is to make the convex, uh, make the body be defined by the convex function. But the trick is in between that, you need to have a body that's just a one dimensional body so that you jump down and back up and sort of approximate the hitting cost through that, those jumps down and back up. Uh, and so you can do both directions. And, and that means that in some sense, convex body chasing is equivalent to uh, SOCO, but there's a dimension change in it where you take a d-dimensional convex body chasing problem and you get a d minus one dimensional SOCO problem. And I emphasize that because if we think about what's known for convex body chasing, you, you know, since the 90s, it's been known that you can be constant competitive for two dimensions for convex body chasing, which then yields a one dimensional SOCO problem, which is the version that we already know how to solve. Uh, and so there's this kind of frustrating alignment there where you think you've made progress and then all of a sudden the algorithms for body chasing don't give you anything new in terms of the algorithms for SOCO. Uh, but then there's been a lot of work pushing this, it, you know, convex body chasing has been a really hot topic in the uh, theoretical computer science world for the last few years with lots of stock box soda papers on it. Uh, and, you know, I guess culminating this year in a paper by Anupam Gupta's group at CMU where they gave uh, an O of D algorithm. So they didn't quite close the gap uh, between root D and D, but you know, there's at least now good algorithms that are sort of on the near, near optimal, just square root off from the optimal to possible dependency in that context. But you know, coming back to our problem and you know, applying this to energy, uh, the challenge here is this isn't good enough if we're gonna apply things in practice. We need to do better than you know, approximating a root D uh, competitive ratio because our problems are, are you know, very high dimensional. Uh, and so the idea here is now knowing this impossibility, we have to do something to find, you know, take advantage of the structure of the problems that we have. Uh, and so the problems that we have don't have this nasty kind of infinite or zero cost function. They tend to look more smooth. Uh, and so, you know, the challenge is how can you exploit that smoothness to do better than this kind of lower bound results and possibility result? 
Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of what we've been able to do in the last year. And, and really I, what I feel like are, have been breakthroughs for, for the area where you can now be constant competitive once you impose a little structure. And so how do we do that? Here's, here's the kind of result that I'll talk about today, which is we can give you a new algorithm, regularized online balanced descent, which is constant competitive. Uh, here, M is the strong convexity parameter. So the smoothness, the curvature of the convex function. And, you know, it's natural. If, if M is small, it means that it's very flat. So it's kind of, you know, nearly that hard case uh, of body chasing. And so the competitive ratio blows up. But as M is, you know, as there's some reasonable curvature, this is a small constant bound uh, for the competitive ratio. Uh, and you know this holds pretty generally in terms of the switching costs and, uh, as well. And you know the key thing here is that this is independent of the dimension, so it's a small constant even if you're in a very high dimensional problem. Uh, and you know even more than that, you might ask what's achievable. You know is this a, a, you know an optimal dependency in some sense? And we're able to show that it is in fact an optimal dependency. We can prove a lower bound that it's possible to do better than this root one over m dependency on the the hitting costs. But even more than that, and this, I mean, this almost never happens. I was so shocked when, when we realized this. Uh, the upper bound matches exactly up to constants, up to precise constant factors, what's achievable for any uh, online algorithm. So, so in some sense, you know, in a real sense, this ROBD algorithm is an optimal uh, in terms of the competitive ratio bound achievable among online algorithms. And so that now hopefully motivates the, uh, the algorithm, hopefully, so now you're interested to understand how we do that. Uh, and so to introduce the algorithm, I'll start by ignoring the regularized bit and we'll build to that. So, so the algorithm is online balanced descent and I'll explain it with a, a picture. So think of you're at X T minus one, all these lines are the level sets of the hitting cost functions C of T uh, that you're now faced with. And the V of T is the minimizer of C of T. Uh, and so, if we come back just you know, to give some context here, what would gradient descent be doing? Gradient descent would be moving in the orthogonal direction from the level set that you're on. Uh, and now it's easy to see with this picture why that's not necessarily a great thing to do because if you're moving to this level set, all the points on this level set have the same hitting cost. So none is better than any other in terms of hitting cost, but there is one that's, much, that's optimal in terms of switching cost which is the one that you'd get to if you project it onto that level set. And so, you know, this point where the blue arrow ends has the same hitting cost as what you would get to from gradient descent, but has a smaller step size and so a smaller switching cost. And so it's just a better place to move in terms of the, in terms of the per round cost. Uh, and, and that's kind of the first idea underlying RBD is that uh, instead of paying attention to the geometry of the cost function where you're starting, pay attention to the geometry of the cost function where you're going to land. Uh, and, and this is kind of a, you know, a really sort of structural difference in the way of thinking about, uh, you know, these descent methods uh, where you're not paying attention to the local geometry, you're paying attention to the intermediate geometry of the cost function. And then, you know, the second idea is how do you choose that level set? So in gradient descent, you're just, you know, have a step size, uh, you know, plan that you're making. You're either taking a fixed or a decreasing step size. Uh, here, you should choose your step size in a, a sort of optimized way, in an adaptive way to balance switching cost and hitting cost. So you choose a step size, uh, a level set to jump to that balances the movement and the hitting, and then you project onto it. So, you know, concretely in math, you're projecting onto a level set and you're choosing that level set, L is the cost of the level set, to balance the hitting cost and the movement cost uh, that you experience in the round and beta is the balance parameter that you choose. And it, we, you, the, the precise choice of the beta actually doesn't turn out to be that important for the algorithm. Uh, and so, you know, those are the two key ideas. Pay attention to intermediate geometry, both in terms of projecting and in, ter in terms of choosing the level set that you, choose, that you land on the step size that you're going to use to adaptively balance and hitting and smoothing or hitting and movement. So this is probably a good point to take a few more questions. Great, thanks. And I think we're probably winding near the end, near the end of the hour now also. So should I let you finish? If you have oh, that's time? true. We're near the end of the hour. I, I didn't realize yeah. I see now the chat. Okay, yeah. So let yeah. me go quickly. So that's, 
Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll keep going there. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so, so that's the first part, but this isn't good enough as it is. So this is uh, uh, you know, good enough to get a m to the negative 2 third, but not good enough to get all the way to the square root. And so you need one other step to get all the way to the square root. And that other step is uh, to be greedy. Uh, and here you again take advantage of the global geometry. Uh, so you step, you, know, you don't pay any attention to the local, you step directly towards the minimizer of the cost function rather than doing anything according to the level sets or the local, local gradients. Uh, and that step size should be uh, order root m. Uh, and then that combination is what gets you to the uh, optimal competitive ratio. Uh, and as I've described it here in sort of the geometric view, it would be hard to compute, but you can approximate that with a, a simple optimization, a simple regularized optimization each round where, you know, I won't go into it, but it's easy to see where, how this simple optimization, this local view uh, approximates the geometric view. Uh, and so that now is regularized online balanced descent. It's computationally simple. You're just solving a, a regularized optimization each round, and it gets you this optimal competitive ratio. Um, and so I'll, I'll just very quickly wrap up from here and say, you know, can an algorithm be constant efficient? We're really, you know, excited now. Finally, we do have something that can be constant competitive in a high dimensional space. Uh, but of course, there's other complexities that come up in these power problems. One of which is dynamics. If we're going to use this for any sort of, you know, local control in a power system, we have to pay attention to the dynamics of, uh, you know, power and the evolution there. Uh, and you know, that means that we have to have some dynamics where you're not choosing your X action like you do in SoCo. You're choosing a control action which then inputs, in fact, uh, sorry, in affects your state through some dynamics, and that makes the whole thing, uh, you know. Uh, a completely different beast seemingly uh, and brings you into the world of control theory. Uh, but I'll just kind of give a teaser here and say, you know, it turns out that you can actually have a very rigorous connection. And this is something that's brand new. We're just writing up where if I add memory and delay to SOCOS, delay meaning you don't observe the cost function for K steps after the current time step and memory meaning that the switching cost depends both on the previous step and the steps before that. So maybe you know, the previous P steps instead of the previous one step. Once you incorporate memory and delay, uh, now you can actually prove a rigorous reduction between control of a linear dynamical system and optimization, you know, online optimization, which then means you, know, you can uh, you know, really get uh, you know, dynamics integrated in these problems as well. And there's an interesting connection between input disturbances in the dynamics and memory, state disturbance in the memory, uh, in the dynamics and delay. Uh, and I won't go over this result at all, but we can extend you know, RBD to work in that context as well. Uh, and you know, I guess I, I'm excited to just show this figure because this we were working on this last night for a paper submission. Uh, and you can really sort of be competitive even with when there's delay. And so this is a drone problem where you're tracking a trajectory and you can see the impact of delay uh, or predictions uh, in terms of the quality of the trajectories you get with this optimistic RBD algorithm. Um, and so with that, I'll wrap up with just by saying, you know, not only can you do dynamics through memory and delay, but you can integrate storage and inventory constraints, non-convex costs and, and predictions as well uh, into these algorithms. And we have papers on each of these that I'm happy to point people to if you're interested. Uh, and, you know, hopefully I've gotten across that you know, I think online optimization is intimately connected with energy. Uh, we've had huge program progress algorithmically uh, in over the last 10 years in our group and, and many other groups. Uh, I talked about the no predictions case, but there's been a similar trajectory when you incorporate predictions into the algorithms. Lots of successful deployments in, in uh, uh, both energy and beyond, and, and lots of open questions that remain both on the algorithmic side and on the application side, because, you know, the applications all used kind of first generation algorithms. Uh, there's been no applications so far that really use these sophisticated algorithms that have just come out in the last couple months or last year uh, for these problems. So I'm really excited to see in the coming years, the improvements we can get in the real applications, real deployments with these new algorithms. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot, Adam. This is a great talk. And I think you ended on a nice note of thinking about progress. And so I'd be curious that to, Hear your thoughts on the big picture of progress on, you know, renewables. What could be done in California, particularly around the deteriorating transmission infrastructure that's obviously been a, uh, in the news a lot recently. So just curious if you could could zoom out a bit and tell us about 
progress. Yeah, I mean, California is a great place to be for looking at these issues because, you know, I'd say the there's a lot of motivation to make changes uh, and there's a lot of, uh, both because of kind of political will and, you know, goals around uh, integration and, and targets, but also because, you know, of exactly that, the deteriorating current system. Um, and so, you know, in terms of progress, I'd say, you know, our, our focus has really been on uh, the three areas I described, markets, uh, reliability, and, uh, you know, integration of DERs. And so for integration of DERs, we've been really actively involved in some test deployments of new uh, market design and new uh, control programs with uh, utilities that, that are neighboring to us. Uh, on the market side, uh, we've had less uh, integration with CalISO yet, but we're really we we we're really excited to push on the integration of non-convex pricing. And there's been a few markets like PGM where where you have started to see non-convex price pricing make its way into deployment, but there's a lot of uh, testing and benchmarking and uh, and things like that that need to be done for that to happen. But I, I actually think that that's going to be uh, a huge when if that can happen because uh one of the the big challenges here is just renewables do not have the properties that the markets you know that we're using today rely on uh, and there are going to be big problems if you integrate them without changing the way markets work and you know i think we're seeing those today and there's got to be a phase shift uh uh in the next few years around the market design. Otherwise, you're going to really end up with uh, problems uh, that curtail the uh, integration of renewables. Uh, and then the one that we're, we're, I'd say, most actively looking for new partners right now, so if there's anybody listening that would be interested in this, is around the reliability. I think, uh, I think there really needs to be a phase change in how people think about designing for reliability uh, and both, you know, thinking about both ways to rigorously localize and design networks that rigorously localize the impact of failures, not just uh, thinking of reliability as something that N-1 is one, uh, you know, solves. And I think one final question in the interest of time, I mean, people are wondering also about the role of machine learning in having yeah. better predictions to help drive better decision making in this space. That's right. I think, you know, I, I didn't talk about predictions at all here because I was already running long, um, but the uh, Predictions are a huge thing when running. So any algorithm that you deploy uh, based on this stuff would be using predictions uh, and the use of, you know, uh, you know, sophisticated learning models, you know, model-free uh, approaches for doing the predictions that you're using is, is really important. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that, you know, so I think that's an obvious one and, and you know, there's a lot of papers there. The, the one that I'd say is emerging that I'm really excited about, we have a couple papers in this and I know a lot of other groups are working on this as well, is the, connection between model-based and model-free approaches to this. So, you know, here, when we, when we integrate dynamics, we're, we're ending up connecting with the model-based, sort of the traditional control viewpoint on how to approach this, where you, you know your dynamics, you have a model of your dynamics, you have a model of your cost function in online optimization, and you're, uh, you know, kind of deploying, applying learning in the context of that, or applying control in the context of that. Uh, model free clearly is exciting and powerful. And so, but you can't deploy it in safety critical things just off the surface. So how do you combine the model free viewpoint of policy iteration with things like we I talked about here or more traditionally things like LQR, uh, MPC type controllers. Uh, and so I think that's really powerful. And, and if the, the opportunity there is to be able to kind of converge and get results about convergence and, and just, you know, efficient uh, behavior in places where the models that we're using are suboptimal or are a little bit too approximate to be perfect and, and some problems arise for that. And that's clearly the case in the power system where, you know, we have these great linear models, but the errors in the models are important and lead to, you know, issues around reliability and model free approaches being integrated into the model based ones has the potential to, you know, really make a big difference around that. Uh, and so we have a couple of papers just coming out where you actually get the best of both worlds by, you know, for example, doing nonlinear control uh, via a combination of a approximate linear model and the optimal linear con model based controller, but, you know, iterating on that with a model free approach and still getting provable guarantees because you're starting from the model based approach. So I, I think that's a really uh, interesting and uh, provocative area to go after. 
Great. Thanks so much, Adam. Really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you in the audience, if you look in the chat in the Zoom, we also have some announcements of upcoming seminars as part of this series. So you can take a look at the, the next two seminars and uh, we hope to see you back again next month for the next seminar. Adam, thanks so much. Really appreciate thanks it. Thanks so much. It was my pleasure.